12 years? Yes. Okay. Uh, and the what, most what's active addiction? Uh, I would describe that as the point uh, at the time where you are heavily addicted to a drug or a substance or even a habit. Uh, so basically it was for me it was alcohol for mm. 12 years mm -hmm. and the events that led me to go to rehab <laughs> uh, I didn't want to go to rehab because one I didn't have a problem I was in denial so I didn't know I had a problem but one morning I woke up with convulsions and my wife got scared of course so at my workplace, there is there's a program to help people who are addicted. So she actually called at the workplace. And when I was to report to work the next morning, I was directed to a counselor's office. And I would say the rest is history, because when I went to talk to the counselor, uh, she asked me a few questions. And then she called another person who happened to be a, a psychiatrist and then I was referred to a treatment center for detox. Mm. But all that time when I was doing that, I was doing it because I, I wanted to please people, to tell them I'm trying to get help. Mm. But in me, I didn't, I didn't think I had a problem. I was okay. I was drinking and going to work, so I'm fine. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and that is what they say, it's denial. It's called denial because I didn't see the problem per se. And I didn't see how it affected uh, me and other people mm -hmm. around me. So it's basically, it was basically a very selfish uh, 12 years. Yeah. It was about me, 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 me. Now, uh, it took some time for me to actually accept that there was a problem. I think over a month. Over a month? Yes, when to I was in, yeah, because I was wow. in rehab for three months. Yeah. So, the so first for the first month, you were still month, like, no, yeah. I don't have a problem. Yeah, I was, I was fighting everybody and telling them, no, I don't have a problem and all that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But slowly, there are a lot of uh, counseling, a lot of uh, psychotherapy, education and all that. I started seeing things from a different perspective. Of course. Yeah. So you accepted what was happening and you then yeah. went into active treatment. Yeah. Now, um, <laughs> back to our counseling psychologist, your expertise opinion when it comes to mental health and addiction in the sense that <clears throat> you had mentioned earlier that sometimes mental health could be the underlying root and then people self-medicate with addictive substances. Mm. I'd like to know, um, and then you also touched on the issue that mental health actually know that alcoholism and addiction is actually a part of a mental health condition. I think that most Kenyans, we have what we call a drinking culture. That's what I'd like to, you know, think. Mm. And, we, you know, every weekend people go out, have their beers, their nyama, and do whatever they have to do, you know. I think we have very much a drinking culture. But at the same time, those that consider it just a drinking culture, I don't think know that if I drink certain number of times during a week, that simply just means I'm an alcoholic, number one. And then number two, if I'm addicted to something, that means I have a mental health condition. Could you kindly explain why alcoholism is a, and addiction is a mental health condition? Because we have such a bad stigma in Kenya when it comes to mental health. You have no idea. When, when Actually, you do have an idea. <laughs> when Mburu was discussing what he has gone through, when he opened up that he had ADHD, there's such a stigma, negative stigma when it comes to mental health. But when people learn that, oh my gosh, um, drinking, being an alcoholic, being an addict to any particular thing is a mental health condition in itself, I think that we could remove that stigma when it comes to other areas of mental health. Mm. Could you kindly discuss this? When, when, when you find that you're drinking more than your peers, your buddies. When you think, when you find that uh, you're usually the first one to the pub and the last one to leave, <laughs> uh, when you find that uh, you're starting to have debts in your local, in your locals, and they know you by name and wow. by your drink, and you can drink any day of the week. You, when you walk in, they when know what to serve you. They don't have to come and ask. Mm. Uh, you're, you're trending on dangerous grounds. Okay. But now, to back to basics, 
addiction is simply a combination of three things. Yeah. Okay. There is an obsession with a drink. Mm -hmm. So you're continuously thinking about the positive effects of the drink, continuously. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There is a compulsion, which is uh, what we call the irresistible urge. Right. Uh, they call it tacky. Tacky. Q. Yeah. Uh -huh. And when that tacky comes, mm -hmm. uh, you will give your 30,000 phone and tell them, give me drinks. I'll, when I get money, I'll come back for the phone. That's, that's crazy. That's, that's not normal. Yeah, that's yeah? not normal. And then finally, there is the loss of control. Yeah. Uh, simply means, uh, I usually like putting it in Swahili, either pombe ishe ama wo ishe. Mm. The two of you can't coexist. You right. can't go and take two beers and leave. Mm. Yeah. Once you start, you, you have the inability to stop. You can't stop. You can't stop. Yeah. When you find that uh, you're continuously having negative effects due to your use, we are talking about booze here. Yeah. When you find that uh, your, drink, your drinking is causing problems at work, your drinking is causing problems at school, your drinking is causing problems at the home front, then there is a problem. Right. All these people cannot be wrong, you're the only one who is right. Of course, yeah. But now, unfortunately, like Edwin alludes to, mm -hmm. one of the biggest uh, symptoms of alcoholism is that uh, denial. Mm. We are always fighting that tag. We are always thinking we're in control, even when it's very clear that we've lost control. Yeah. Mm. Now, to the mental uh, health angle, w we need to understand that uh, alcohol acts on the <coughs> brain. Yeah. Mm. Brain imaging shows that uh, when, when compared between somebody who does not drink and somebody who drinks heavily and is in al into alcoholism, you'll find that uh, we may have a condition that's called a wet brain. A wet brain? Yes. What is a wet brain? Now, a wet brain occurs when alcohol has affected your brain to the extent that when imaging is done, you, you find there are bits and pieces of holes in the brain. Yeah. Actual holes? Actual holes. Wow. Yeah. Caused by excessive Caused drinking. by excess. Remember, when alcohol is taken in excess, it becomes a poison to the brain. Sure. Yeah. So even physical, mm -hmm. physically, mm -hmm. you'll find that it has started affecting the brain. Once the brain has started being affected, it becomes a mental health challenge. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So there's, there's a reputable proof that alcoholism, uh, the DSM, the Diagnostic Statistical Manual, which is what uh, psychiatrists use to, to distinguish between the different uh, mental disorders, mm. uh, classifies uh, alcoholism as a mental disease. Yeah. Simply because it affects the brain. It affects the brain. It's that simple. It's, it's that simple. Yeah. yeah? Mm. So, uh, and the, the saddest, and again, I like the way Edwin uh, puts it, mm -hmm. the alcoholic is usually the last person to know that they have a disorder. Yeah. I usually say alcoholism mm. uh, is, is one of the saddest disease because everybody around you can see that there is a problem except the person who is suffering from the disease. Yeah. So everybody, everybody will be con con continuously telling you, you need to change, you need to stop, you need to. And most people deep down, they know when they cross the line. They know okay. we, we, we have a problem. Deep down, Deep you'll down just know, know within yourself. Yeah. Yeah. And they will continuously try to address the problem. They will try to cut down, they in will private. try to switch drugs or drinks, they will try to do whatever it takes. They will switch to wine, they will think it's, it's uh, whiskeys that are a problem, and I'll switch to beers, it's beers that are a problem, I'll switch to, uh, and all that. But unfortunately, uh, for most people, unless you seek treatment, uh, those self uh, remedies do not work. Mm -hmm. mm. And when it comes to someone who's undergone living with um, addiction and you've come out on the other end sober for three years, nine months and 12 days, that's amazing. I know that there are people who maybe drink every day at the end of the day, like Bada Akazi. And uh, I don't know if they see 
what could be happening or where their life could be spiraling to because at the same time they keep telling themselves I'm just having one beer at the end of work and I go home but for you I'd like to know how it spiraled out of control number one and number two um, our our counseling psychologist James Mwadi he said that it affects family it affects even your work how did it affect you at work and also your wife? Because you said she did call in and say, maybe my husband needs help or something. But um, it, there could be more negative effects than what you went through in a different home. There could be a wife who's breaking down because she doesn't understand why her husband is drinking so much. She doesn't know where to call. She doesn't know where to go to look for help. But she's just watching her husband go down this drain. Um, or vice versa, because it happens to women as well, which is what we'll discuss next. Um, please, could you touch on how it's affected your personal life in terms of family and relationships? Mm -hmm. In terms of family, you know the process is gradual. Right. Uh, you don't get addicted on day one. So as I, con as, as I continued using, mm -hmm. uh, people started pointing it out that I'm doing it too much. They pointed it out. Yeah. yeah. And when they do, you automatically become my enemy because I want to drink. Wow. Okay? Uh -huh. I cut ties. I can't come to your place. When you call me, I can't pick up. So those ties uh, started getting severed slowly. Right. Yeah. And by the time I was, uh, I was going to rehab, uh, some of them were non-existent because mm -hmm. uh, people had, you know, uh, when you see somebody with potential, somebody who is young and is can thrive in whatever it is that they are doing and is drawing all that away and he can't see it or she can't see it uh, even you as a person you just let it be because there's only so much at times people can do and now for my wife was just concerned she didn't know actually what to do and she had seen it uh, by that time we had been married for about four years so she had seen it she had suffered through it. Uh, my parents and my siblings also had seen it to the point that they were like, he's our son, but there's only so much you can, we can do. Right. And at, at the end of it all, they were like, if you, they, they actually told my wife, if you need to leave this guy, we would support you. Mm. Because PSCC mm -hmm. there's only so much we can do and we don't want you to suffer. So. And I, I wasn't violent physically or verbally. I was just never there. I would go for three, four days, but I'm going to work, uh, but I'm not going home. Yeah. And when it came to work, you find that at times I would be late consistently. And I always convinced the bosses that uh, I had a genuine issue. Mm. And addicts, people who are in active addiction, they are very convincing, they are very manipulative. So I always had a way of uh, turning things around so that you can look at it from my own view, not from your own view. So I am late and I passed by a bar or I left the, uh, the bar at, uh, at 2 mm -hmm. or at 5 in the morning, but I'll come to work at 10 or 9 mm -hmm. and I'll convince you that something actually had happened and you will believe and it. I believe you. Yeah. Hey. Wow, that's interesting. So you've, you've touched on the fact that addicts can be very controlling, manipulative, yeah. yes. and they're very good at um, <clears throat> convincing people. Yeah. But when it comes to that, um, I'd like for people to know, because then again, we've already discussed about Kenya being a culture of drinking. It's just something we, we see in Nikito Tumezoea. We can't label everybody as an alcoholic because we don't know what they're doing during the week. Yeah. We might see what they're doing during the weekend, but we don't know what they're up to during the week. So we might not be able to label all of us as alcoholics. But let's now go to the issue of gender. This is also an issue where <laughs> the stigma is so bad when it comes to females. It, it's, a, it's a point where it's rare to see a lady seated at a bar, you know, maybe having her glass of wine or whatever it is, without people thinking she's a prostitute. It's just that simple. And so when you find women who are alcoholics or who are addicts or women who have ended up in rehab, there's that stigma for it. If you're truly a lady, I don't see why you should even be in rehab. If, if you're a lady, why do you have a drinking problem? If you're a lady, why do you have an addiction problem? This is something only for men. But that's not true. And I'd like to hear your expertise on this, please. It's good that you touch on, 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 on the ladies, uh, because uh, 
currently we are, we, are, we are trying to formulate a program for women only. Okay. Yeah. Reason being, uh, like you rightly put it, there is a lot of stigma on, on, on women who uh, pick up an addiction or the other. Yeah. Uh, society has not been kind on the woman. That's very true. Uh, woman is considered to be the homemaker, she should be on top of things and we think the men are allowed to fall around the roadside and everything, but not women. Yeah. What this is doing is the women who have issues are not seeking help. Exactly. They are going under. Yeah. And the more they go under, the worse the, 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 the addiction becomes. And, and you find that uh, apart from the alcohol, they, they start picking other things. I know I've had women who are addicted to cough syrup. Yeah. Mm. So the, she always has cough syrup in the bag. Uh, nobody will nobody, suspect, yeah. yeah. So every time, but we've had cases where people, women, are getting into big, huge debts because of cough syrup, because in a day she's doing twelve bottles. Twelve bottles. Yeah, yeah. Because there's a chemical in there that there, there is the codeine, that alleviates your the, mind. There is the codeine that that creates that uh, high, buzzy feeling. And she needs twelve to get that high. Exactly. Because consistently throughout the day. And she doesn't want the smell of alcohol. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So there is, there is a lot of stigma when it comes down to women. But what we need to understand is that, uh, again, coming from what you point out about uh, the culture that we have, mm -hmm. we are going more towards the Western way of doing things, okay. where a woman and, and, and self-empowerment and all that, mm -hmm. a woman is working and will want to unwind at the end of the day. Uh, so she will pass by the pub and take a bottle or two and go home. But then again, I've heard Mboru say it, it does not start on day one. You do not become addicted the day you touch booze. Mm -hmm. It takes a while. Right. The same way that a man would get into addiction is the same way that a lady will get into addiction. Right. Yeah. There's no discrimination. There's no, there's, in fact, uh, studies are showing that uh, the woman is likely to become an addict faster than a man. Right. Yeah. So studies have shown that women are actually getting <laughs> have into a chance addiction. to become uh, an addict more than men. Exactly. Our chances are higher. Exactly. Right. But then the inverse is women seek treatment less because of the stigma. And and again it's it's I think the the African culture. No father wants to say my daughter is in rehab. Of He'd course. rather say my son is in rehab. Yeah. It's considered manly to drink mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. and, and bragging rights mm. than a woman. So women, we have a problem. We have a problem. We have a problem. And we need to address that issue so that uh, well, women can feel comfortable enough to come out and fight for their life and fight for you know, a new beginning. Because so many women I know are going through, no, not I know, but so many women just going through addiction. I know Let that they won't speak out. They mm. will not go to rehab. They won't even see a psychologist. They won't tell a friend. They're not going to tell, even, even their best friend is not going to know. Mm. This is something they probably do in the house by themselves. Let me, let me give you a flip side on the, on the woman. Yeah? The woman is more emotional than the man. Okay. Because of the hormonal imbalances during menses and all this. Yeah. So the woman, by <coughs> nature, is more hormonal, uh, mm -hmm. is more emotional. Mm -hmm. Going back to the uh, bit of self-medicating, it's easier for a woman to try and self-medicate against these up and down moods than a man. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, when this happens, and, and that's mm -hmm. why we are saying uh, women are likely to be to develop addictions than mm -hmm. men, mm -hmm. it's because of all the hormonal issues. Yeah. Look at uh, the postpartum depression that comes along with childbirth. Right. That men never experience. Yeah. So there's this woman who has just given birth. She feels uh, the man is not supportive enough. Mm. The man is out in the pub drinking with his buddies because <laughs> he's just gotten a son or a daughter. Yeah. The woman is at home feeling helpless, crying and tired. all that. Mm. Again, it's uh, tired, exactly, mm. tired and... So it's, it's easier for, for women because of the hormonal imbalance. It's easier for women to pick up self-medicating. 
Right. So as, as that's going on, she's slowly getting depressed at home and she's self-medicating at home without the knowledge of the husband. Without the knowledge of the husband. For women, again because of the stigma, people discover when they are deep in it, when they are already too deep in it. When you look at the statistics in rehabs, very few women seek treatment. Mm. And the women who come in... What, what are the statistics for women that come into rehab? Probably, if I give a ratio of uh, men to women, it's about 7 to 1. For every 7 wow. male who come in, one woman. Yeah. But uh, again, unfortunately, uh, that's not the case on the ground. Yeah. Especially with today's culture, mm -hmm. like you're saying, uh, I would say women are drinking as hard as their male counterparts. Wow. Females are drinking as hard as their male counterparts. This is something if people not harder. don't know. If not harder. Females are actually <laughs> drinking <laughs> as hard as their male counterparts, if not yes, harder. Yes. Wow. Uh, we know, the more we give out these statistics, the more people understand that, look, this is something that does not discriminate genders. This, you know, addiction and mental health as a whole does not know, ah, this is a woman or this is a man. It doesn't know. It's just circumstances in life that will lead you to, you know, the path of mental health or addiction. And um, Boru, lastly and very shortly, I'd like for you to give a chance on, um, maybe for someone who is struggling with alcoholism, who right now is watching the show and they need a word of encouragement that things can get better that they can stay sober for three years, nine months, and 12 years, just like you and even more. Could you give a short word of encouragement, please? And what I would like to say is addiction is a disease. And just like any other disease, it can be addressed. It and can treated. Be, it can be addressed and managed. I've been able to manage mine for three years, heading on to four. You get? So these. I know there's a lot of uh, stigma about it, mm -hmm. but rise above it. Seek help. There are people who you can talk to, just like I said last time, know your support system. When things get tough, look for that one person. Tell them, I think I have a... Because deep down, we all know there's something wrong. You will know. I, I, I knew I had a problem, but I didn't want to. It was easier for me to drink than to come and tell somebody I need help. But what I've come to realize is there is help. Help is there, a lot of it. Support groups are there. There is AA, Alcoholic Anonymous. It is in Kenya. Right, yeah. You go for meetings. I, do, I go for meetings. Okay. Th that is a support system in itself. And it helps so many people get sober. So there is help. Right. Yeah. And it's a disease just like any other. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, wow. Yeah. There is yeah. hope. Mm, there is hope. And, um, before we close down the show, I'd like to, for addiction, maybe a couple of weeks from now, we'll touch on other sorts of addictions when it comes to drugs, hardcore addiction, and how um, we can help our youths to that. I'll come out, come out of that, excuse me. Thank you so much for staying in. Thank you for tuning in to Help on Monday. It has been wonderful to talk to you guys. And we've seen some of the um, questions and suggestions that you guys had. We shall get back to you on those. But we didn't have enough time to do that. But um, what I can suggest is continue to interact with us. The hashtag is health on Monday and why, hashtag why in the morning. My name is Joy Mochache. This has been Health on Monday. Please remember that we shall be discussing hardcore addiction in the maybe couple of weeks to come. So if you have anyone that's suffering with this or you yourself, you're suffering with that, please continue to tune in. Thank you.